What a glorious morning it has been already to walk out into what is a beautiful sunshiny day and it not be 105 degrees. It was so wonderful. This weekend, David and I went up to Oklahoma City to see my brother and uh, my only living grandmother that was still alive and got to go to my cousin's football game. He's a coach in Stroud, Oklahoma. And uh, uh, we were leaving the house, and I said, you know, we probably ought to take jackets just in case. I know in Texas those are almost unheard of. But we got up there, and we were so thankful we had coats because it was, it was downright cool. I think it was down at 75 or something. It was <laughs> quite amazing. You know, it's a, that time of year, you know, we, we, we enjoy this time, these three weeks of fall before it gets really cold and windy, and we're so thankful for the opportunities we have to, to recreate, to entertain ourselves, and to uh, watch some football. You know, it was one of those times of free play, and I was watching boys let off some steam you know there were there was no coaches no parents to mess anything up it was just the boys a ball and a field and it was in those moments that they were playing and yelling and running and pretending to be you know an Aaron Rodgers going into the playoff or an Earl Campbell in his prime and making the perfect juke or or spin move that would confuse even the best defensive back and and while I was watching them play one of the little ones broke free ran with all of his heart to what was marked out as the the end zone and he scored a touchdown and that's when I heard the opposing team protest we do not accept that touchdown and I thought where was that rule when I was a kid let me just go on record today of saying that that this weekend when Texas plays Oklahoma, we do not accept any touchdowns that Texas makes. You know, we, when we were kids, it seemed like rules of the game were a bit more fluid and situational. They seemed to change to benefit, well, me and not you. I remember as kids, we would be on the playground and, and we, would, we would give the rules of each play ahead of time. You know, it was like uh, down, five, five Mississippi rushing, no creaming center, set hut, and we'd, we'd do the play. And then as the game progressed and other rules need to be added, or they'd be tacked onto that, that, that pre-cadence count like uh, no handoffs. You know, there's that one snarky team that says, you know, well, I'm going to hand it off. They're all expecting pass. Well, it's, so it's, you know, down, no creaming center, five Mississippi rushing, no handoffs, no running faster than Sam, set hut. And we, we would go playing. And by the end of the day, no one wanted to play anymore because to read the constitution of the game before each play, just it didn't make sense. And rules changed. But you know, when the rules change, especially when they change in the middle of the game, it's confusing and usually impossible to win. Because when someone changes the rules, they like to change it to benefit themselves. And if, if I'm changing all the rules to benefit me, there's no possible way you can win. Because in the end, I'll just make one rule. You can't win. And that'll work, right? Imagine if the rules of life changed from day to day. Or even year to year, based upon the whims of some leader in some other part of the world. Somewhere where each rule was, was bent or modified or turned or twisted in a way that, that suited his fancy for the moment. Because tomorrow he may feel differently. Thankfully, God is in control. And his rule book doesn't change. You know, the Bible is our rule book for living. It tells us how to treat one another how we worship God, our great creator. It tells us where to go when we're hurting. It tells us what to do when we've messed up our lives. You know, the Bible is, is the rule book that gets us where we are going. We might say, you know, are, are you sad? We'll, we'll, we'll go to the book. Are you angry at the world or at your neighbor? We'll, we'll go to the book. Are you happy and things are going well? Go to the book. Are you jealous? Envious of what others might have that you don't have? Go to the book. 
In fact, God has recorded in this book the answers for how to live. From anger to happiness to scared. You know, he has dealt with every emotion and every pathology, every psychology, every action, every attitude. Every personality is dealt with in his book. And Romans 15 and verse 4 tells us that though whatever was written in former days was written for our instructions, that through the endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We understand there's an old law and there's a new law. We understand that God dealt with some people in different times and different ways, but we also understand this. God's word through it all has remained unchanged. Who God is has remained unchanged. What God calls and requires of us has remained unchanged. Like Jesus, it is the same yesterday, today, yea, and forevermore. And we take heart in that. The unchanging word of God. In a world that seems more and more fluid that seems more and more apt to change. We look at our childhood and we see what has happened in the world, what has happened in the United States of America, what has even happened in our own small communities and how things have changed from when we were tots until our current age. And for some of, that, that, uh, for, for some of us, that has been a vast many years for some, it has been just a few years, but I've even heard of teenagers reminiscing of how things were different just five or six or ten years ago. The world's changing. But through it all, there's a constancy. It is God and His Word. The unchanging Word of God is unchanging first because it it comes directly from an unchanging God. In Malachi 3 and verse 6, God is explaining to the nation of Israel why they're still alive. <laughs> Sometimes as parents, we have to explain to our children why they're still alive. It's not because they're so smart. It's because we have protected them against some of their own decisions. That's what God is telling them. He says that I, Jehovah, change not. Therefore, the sons of God or the sons of Jacob are not consumed. You have not destroyed yourself because I am faithful to keep my promises. He had promised a, a seed that was going to come and would, would save the entire world, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed in the coming Messiah. The Messiah had not come yet, so God was keeping this nation alive. It wasn't because they were so good. It wasn't because they were so perfect. It wasn't because they had not sinned. It was because God was still working his promise. I, Jehovah, change not. I'm not going to waver from the promise that I made to mankind. Therefore, the sons of man are not consumed. God does not change. In Psalm 102, beginning verse 25 he says, you, O Lord, have laid the foundations of the earth. The sky is the work of your hands. But they will pass away. You know, it's interesting how many times in the Bible God uses the heavens and the earth as witnesses. Heaven and earth will pass away. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. It's because there is a constancy of their witness. It never has changed. There is no time in human history in which there was not an earth. There is no time in human history in which there was not a sky. It has always been the case that mankind can look up into the stars and be mesmerized by the handiwork of God. It has always been the case that man, when he gets up out of bed and he places his feet on the floor, that terra firma is always going to be there. And yet he says in this psalm, those will one day wear out. They will wear out like a garment. A couple of weeks ago, I came home and I showed Julie the, the cuff of my shirt. It frayed. It was just loose thread sticking out. And back up on the top of the cuff, there were, there were large holes. 
The shirt's probably seven or eight years old. I'm wearing it out. Last night, Jason's at home and he's gluing the sole of his shoes together because they're wearing out. Clothes are made to wear out. And he said, heaven and earth, those two constancies that you think would never wear out, he says, they will wear out and God will replace them. They will wear out like a garment and he's going to change them like a robe. But he says, but you, oh God, are the same. God doesn't change. God doesn't wear out. God doesn't fray on the edges. God doesn't get holes and become useless or irrelevant in our lives. As the world, as the heavens and the earth will pass away, God will remain constant. James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom is no variation nor shadow of turning. God doesn't turn with the times. He doesn't change on a whim. What he said he wanted a thousand years ago is what he wants today. What he said he wanted 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago contain, or continues to be constant and true today. Hebrews 13, 5. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, yea, and forevermore. God does not change. As a result, his word or his message does not change. When Jesus is speaking about the, the destruction of Jerusalem in the end of time, in Matthew 24, they've come to him and they've said, When will these things be, Jesus? When he was looking at the temple and he said not one stone would be left on top of another. When will these things be? What will be the signs of your coming? And what will be the signs of the end of time? And Jesus begins to answer the questions. The destruction of the Jerusalem. You're going to hear about the wars and the rumor of wars. About that destruction you're going to hear people Talk about the earthquakes. You're going to see the earthquakes and you're going to see all these signs that will come to pass. And then he transitions to that time of, of that day, of the end of time. No one knows, not even the Son of Man. But to guarantee his word in that moment, in chapter 24 and verse 35, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. I'm telling you, these are the signs of the destruction of Jerusalem. If heaven and earth fail to exist, my promise is still true that these things will come to pass. The word of God, like God, is constant. In Matthew 5, in the great Sermon on the Mount, he says, Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Think not that I've come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill, to accomplish what mankind needs to accomplish. And until it is finished, not one iota, not one dot, not one stroke, not one tick mark, not the slightest stroke will pass away from the law. I guarantee it by heaven and earth. Or as the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 89 says, that forever, O Lord, your, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. The psalmist understood the word is unchanging. It is settled. It is firmly fixed in the heavens. A few verses later in Psalm 119, 152, long have I known from your testimonies, that is your word, that you have founded them, that same word, forever. They are forever. The word does not pass away. The word does not change with the whims and the fancies. It doesn't change as the world changes and society changes and man becomes more sophisticated. The word of God does not change. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, Beginning in verse 24, all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of the grass. But the grass withers, and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. 
just as we wake each morning to the constancy of the heaven and the earth, we will wake also to the constancy of the word of God. And where heaven and earth may fail, his word will remain forever. So we have an unchanging God who's given us an unchanging word. And it will remain unchanged until the very day of judgment. We open our Bibles to Revelation 20 and he he begins speaking of the great white throne and he that sat upon it and before him appeared all the dead, the great and the small. Everyone is standing before the judgment throne of God and it says, and the books were opened. Multiple books. And the Lamb's book of life. At least three books. Some have suggested that the first two books were in reference to the old, to old law and the new law. And certainly it fits with the rest of the Bible. Jesus said, he that rejects me has one that judge him. The word which I have spoken shall judge him on the last day. Whether one of those books is the word of Christ, the New Testament, or, or whether he's speaking of something else, we know that that word is going to be there on the day of judgment. On that day, the word which today guides us is the word which is going to judge us. And not one T will be uncrossed, not one I will be undotted, exactly as you read it here today, this morning, in the here and now. This word will judge us in the there and the then. And that judgment is unchanging. It is appointed unto a man once to die, And after that comes the judgment. There's a lot of people who will be sorely mistaken on that day of judgment that will be more than disappointed because they have changed or sought to change the word of God. There are some who have sought to change the very purpose of the church. Why the church is just a social club. It's just a way to pad my resume. Maybe I'm trying to seek some office or I'm trying to get some job and it just looks better on my resume that I was a member of the West Hill Church of Christ for four years. It's like being part of the polo club or part of the football team. It's just a little bit extra on my resume. Denying that the purpose of the church is to glorify God, is to, to, to bring honor and, and glory to his name and to show him forth to a community that is lost and dying and say, this world, this world is your only hope. It is in God. And when people change the purpose of the church, they're trying to change the word. They're trying to change God and it simply won't work. People will be disappointed because they have sought to change the entrance requirements of the church. Well, we'll turn it into the uh, sinner's prayer. You ask Jesus to come into your heart. We'll say, we'll say that, that you can be part of the church through faith only. Or go to the other extreme. When you've worked enough to, to gather God's fancies, then you can be saved. But that's not what the book says. The unchanging word of God tells us that through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, we might be added to the Lord's church by his grace, that our sins would be removed. And there's going to be a lot of people on the day of judgment that are sorely disappointed because they listen to the words of men instead of listening to the unchanging word of God. There are those who have sought to change the worship of the church into some sort of showmanship or entertainment or some good feel-goodism that you just come here and we just want to make you feel better about yourself and about the sin that you, you uh, have surrounded yourself in. That's not what the book says. The unchanging word of God challenges us to move past our sin out of the old ways and into God's ways. There are those who have sought to change preachers into preacherettes. Taking what God said, I will that men pray in every place, to saying God didn't really care about that, men and women are fine. There's going to be a lot of people who are destroyed on the day of judgment because they are trying to change the unchangeable word of God. 
who are trying to change singing into playing, who have sought to change sinners into heroes, laud them as heroes. Abominations become the adoration of society. Love is called hate, and hate is called love. This has been happening happening since the days of Isaiah when he warned them, woe unto you when you put light for darkness and darkness for light, and bitter for sweet and sweetness for bitterness. When you try to change the world upside down, land it on his head and leave it that way. Last week, we were told by the religious leader, the Pope who came to the United States of America, someone asked about their, their dearly beloved and departed Fido. And he said, he said that we will see our pets in heaven because there's room in heaven for all of God's creatures. What's happening is we are taking the inexpressible glory of heaven and the heaven that a lot of people want is becoming more and more like the earth that we already have. And when we start changing the glory of heaven into, into the sullied, burned out, lower class of this world that we're called to live in but not be a part of, we are lowering our expectations and we are changing the word of God. So what does this mean for us? Okay, Sam, we have a God that doesn't change. We have a word that doesn't change. We have judgment ahead of us that will not change. And yes, there's all kinds of people in the world that are changing things. But, but what does it mean to say the word does not change? And I'll say these four things and then the lesson will be yours. Number one, if the word has not changed, then sin still terrorizes us. It is still bringing spiritual death. The wage of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 and verse 1. There is no other way to describe it. Sin terrorizes our lives. It brings us down. It separates us from God. It is destroying us from the inside out. Not only that, number two, if sin terrorizes us, then I also know this, judgment still awaits us. We cannot escape it. Hebrews 9, 27, but tells us that death is appointed unto a man once died, and after that comes the judgment. But think about the picture painted in Revelation 6, beginning in verse 15. The kings of the earth and the great ones, the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slaves and free, they hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And then they start calling. Calling to the mountains and calling to the rocks. Fall on us. Hide us from the face of he who sits upon the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? I remember the first time I read those words. I remember the pain it caused me to think of those who are so estranged from God, who are so foreign from His grace, those who have lived their lives exactly how they wanted to live it on this earth. They live for the here and the now. They've received the reward of the here and the now. And now all of a sudden on the day of judgment, they're hiding in the rocks and they're asking the mountains, please fall upon us. Crush us to smithereens. Grind us back into the dust of the earth to hide us from the face of God. From the wrath of his son. Who will be able to stand? Judgment still awaits us. And if you're not prepared for that judgment, then the best you can hope for is that the, the mountains grind you to dust. But even then, there's no escape. 
Because they ask that question at the end of that statement, who can stand? And the answer did not come back to them, those who are ground to dust, those who are hidden by the mountains and the caves. But the answer came back, those who are faithful in the Jewish times and those who are faithful today, this innumerable host. Judgment still awaits us. The solace is, number three, that Christ still invites us. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. That's an invitation. An invitation from the Son of God who knows our predicament He knows the terror of sin because he has watched it since the day of the Garden of Eden. He knows that judgment awaits because he knows it's been set by the Father in his glory. And he invites us, escape that judgment, stand on that day, come and take my yoke upon you for I am gentle and lowly. The word of God doesn't change and that assures me of number four, that we still have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. I can't make the choice for you. The elders here can't make the choice for you. Even Jesus cannot make that choice for you. You have a choice to make. The word of God is unchanging and it tells us, it tells us all along that if you do not choose to follow him today, that you're not guaranteed tomorrow. If you choose to ignore this invitation this morning, You may never hear another one for the rest of your life. You may never come to him. You may never be saved by his grace. Will we hide in the rocks and the caves cowering because God or because we have have changed God's word to suit our lives? Or will we submit to him in humble obedience? Will we be damned because we could not or would not choose to obey him when we are estranged? Or will we come to him this morning? Will you stay in your backsliding condition? Will you allow pride to keep you where you are? Well, I'm okay. I don't have anything to worry about. Or will you answer the invitation this morning? I know if if you could do it by proxy, there's a host of people in this room would obey the gospel for you right now. If we could do it by proxy, there are those who are sitting next to you and across the room from you that would come forward and repent of the sins that you've committed. But we can't do it that way. You have to do it on your own. And this morning, we beg you to do that while we stand and while we sing.